G'day everyone, welcome back to Europe 1100. This is your mod author, Fat Rod, aka Rodimus. Uh, today what I'm going to do is take you through uh, an overview of the mod, including things like the playable cultures, the kingdoms uh, that exist within the world, uh, the clans, and the troop trees. So, let's get into it. So here we are on the culture selection screen. First thing to call out is that a culture is different to a kingdom. That sounds obvious, but people always forget this. Um, and the culture that you choose has no impact on either a kingdom that you create in the future or a kingdom that you join either as a vassal or as a mercenary. Um, there's only a couple of things that cultures actually influence. Um, the first of those is the bonus that you receive down here. Uh, and these bonuses only apply once you create um, your own kingdom and have your own settlements. Um, these are actually just the vanilla um, bonuses. I haven't created new ones, but I have redistributed these um, amongst the new cultures where I thought appropriate. The other thing that cultures affect is your settlement loyalty bonus, and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, as well as things like cultural names um, when you generate a character, um, when children get generated, etc. For example, um, let's go with a uh, Turkic culture skip through and when it comes time to generate a name it's picking something that is culturally appropriate both first names and surnames so some cultures only have a handful of settlements um, at the start of the game um, whereas others are quite large for example, uh, the Frankish culture um, has much of modern day France. Holy Roman Empire, uh, which uh, has a German culture, covers a very large area, including parts of modern day France, northern Italy, uh, Austria and Hungary. Uh, Byzantines, um, reasonably large. They have a, a, a large number of settlements, um, quite a few island states over here, uh, or, or cities I should say, um, which contributes to their overall size. Um, and also the Almoravid Berbers, who have um, multiple settlements in North Africa as well as in the Iberian Peninsula. So the other point to make is um, about settlement loyalty. So if we look at Marseille here, um, it's owned by the Holy Roman Empire, the province clan, but the culture is French. Um, obviously that is different to the culture of the Holy Roman Empire uh, and the owning clan. So what that does is it gives a rather large negative bonus to settlement uh, loyalty. So you can see owner culture minus three. Um, overall, that's giving the settlement minus 2.62 and the loyalty is going to continue to reduce to the point where this settlement may even rebel. So um, something to keep in mind is if you are targeting specific settlements you want to capture in the future and you want to um, uh, manage those easily without risk of rebellion, you may want to pick a culture that has the, um, uh, the same one as the settlement that you're after. Um, there are a number of settlements in the game that do have a different culture to the faction that owns them. Um, Lyon is another one. Um, over in Italy, we have um, some French culture, uh, the Castle of Nietzsche, um, as well as a few others scattered around the place. This is done for two reasons. One is for historical accuracy, primarily, um, but it also means there's a handful of settlements that are likely to rebel in the early game. Um, and that's good if you want to uh, actually attempt to capture one of those to establish your kingdom. You won't have to go to war with a major faction. So the next thing we're going to cover is the troop trees. So the main source of information for our troop trees is this book by Ian Heath. Uh, and uh, thank you to my colleague Eric uh, from Eric's Troops for introducing me to this book. Um, what this does is it covers off things like uh, what types of troop uh, and how armies were put together in um, our time period, but also contains these amazing illustrations detailing exactly what type of weapons and armor um, individual units used. So what I've done in Europe 1100 is based all units off um, the materials in that book and, and a few other sources. 
Uh, and this is why you might see some cultures are far less heavily armored um, than others. The other thing I've done is attempted to use the vanilla assets to recreate these troops as best I can. Um, anyone who uses Eric's troops will know that Eric um, uses the expanded Bannerlord Armory, which contains a, a large number of fantastic new assets, um, armors, uh, weapons, etc. Two reasons I, I have not opted to use that. One is that I wanted to keep the core mod um, a lot smaller and not have a dependency on the, the expanded Bannerlord Armory. Um, but also, once Eric um, created his sub mod, um, you know, I want to continue to support that um, and, uh, you know, allow others to continue to refine the troop trees as they see fit. So there's a unique troop tree for each culture in the game. Now these are separated into both uh, militia and noble lines. So if we take a look at the English tree for a moment, um, here is our militia line, um, which is split into uh, infantry, culture unique, and then ranged. Uh, and also let's take a look at our noble tree, which is typically um, just three types of cavalry. So the troop trees are smaller than vanilla. We have 12 troops in total versus uh, 20 in the, in the core game. Um, but that is done for two reasons. One, for balance. Um, and two, for historical accuracy, there, there wasn't this huge number of different types of troops um, at this period in time. So I wanted to keep it, you know, more historically accurate, but also have them be meaningful. One thing I have done is attempted to create some sort of balance between the cultures with not everyone having every type of troop. So, for example, um, England has our standard spearmen. Um, and I guess you could say a, a heavy infantry or anti-infantry with one-handed and two-handed axemen and then um, a longbow unit. If we compare these to the Irish, for example, um, again, a, a light spearman also have one axeman, but not a high-level spearman. Um, and then they have skirmishers and light cavalry. So this should make for some interesting matchups between cultures. Another point to note is that the militia are incorporated into the main troop tree. So in the vanilla game, um, both militia and veteran militia units are totally separate to the main troop trees and can never be upgraded um, other, from, other than um, base to veteran. However, in Europe 1100, um, the basic levy units will all be upgraded to militia and then they can uh, either uh, upgraded further into a unique unit um, or into um, the highest tier um, for that particular type of weapon, for example, spearman uh, or, or ranged unit. Um, this is great because it means you, um, you're you getting higher quality militia units within your settlements, um, so better for defence, um, but also though they can be upgraded um, and you don't end up with this huge pool of militia units that um, you can't ever do anything with. Having said that, they will still be the most numerous units in the game because they get generated by garrisons, um, but they are, they are upgradable. So just to call out a couple of the unique units in game, um, looking at the German troop tree here and in the middle line, which is pretty much always the, the cultural unique line, um, we can see we've got the Swabian Swordsman. It's one of my personal favourites um, because it's one of the only uh, two-handed infantry characters in game. Um, also one of the only real two-handed swordsmen that existed um, you know, in history. Um, that's actually much rarer than people realise. Um, I've also got a, a, an upgradable version to the mounted Swabian. That mount may seem a little bit ridiculous, but there's actually a, a historical precedence for this. Um, the Battle of Civitate in uh, 1053, I believe, um, in southern Italy. Um, a papal army um, with some Swabian uh, soldiers fighting a Norman army, which has invaded. Um, and the Norman sources um, refer to the Swabians as uh, terrible, terrible horse riders, very clunky. Um, but once they got off their horse, uh, very deadly with their two-handed sword. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd include that one. A um, few others to call out. Um, if we look at our Spanish troop trees, yeah, let's go back a step.
Um, so both these Spanish and Portuguese trees pretty much a carbon copy of each other, but with um, Portuguese versus Spanish um, naming. Um, within their uh, unique tree, we have the, the genitae. So one of the few um, skirmisher cavalry units in the uh, in the Europe 1100 mod. There's far more in vanilla, um, but I've only got a handful, so that's one of them. Also very lightly armoured, the Spanish tree. Um, you can see just from the um, just from the overview here, a lot of leather uh, and very little mail, except for a handful on the on the unique units. Um, and the last one to call out is on the Polish troop tree, the, the noble line, in fact, where we have um, some of the only mounted crossbow units in the game. Um, very heavily armoured um, and also, uh, uh, also has a, a spear and a lance. So um, very dangerous if you run into these troops. A few other notable mentions. Um, the Byzantine tree is probably the most heavily armoured. Um, this is probably uh, uh, both, both historically accurate, but also a bit incorrect on the specific time period. Um, the Byzantine troops, if you look at the sources, do have these, you know, exact armour types, um, which is why we've been able to recreate them. Um, but also, if you look at the Crusader sources, they talk about how, um, or the very poor condition <laughs> of the Byzantine army um, after the Battle of Manzikert. So, whilst I think this is correct, um, you know, the, the, the troops may not be the, the same quality um, as what we get in game. But for our mod at least, um, the Byzantine troops are probably some of the best. Um, by comparison, the Italian troops. Um, Again, similar to the Spanish, we see a lot of leather, very, uh, very lightly armoured. Uh, again, this is based on historical sources. Um, this is during the time of the emergence of the Italian um, merchant states, um, with a lot of, a lot of sailors, a lot of naval um, warfare, um, and most of their their military units were really just town militia. Um, but we, you know, we, we do compensate a little bit. We give them some um, some light cavalry and some mounted cavalry. Um, and they're one of the, you know, the cheaper cavalry units available in the game. The last one to call out are our Crusader troops. Now, anyone who's been playing the mod for a little while will know that the, the Crusaders have gone through a few different iterations. Originally, this was a much larger tree uh, and um, was dedicated. there was a dedicated Crusader culture. Um, but I've decided to remove that because it, it wasn't historically accurate at all. Uh, at all. Um, with the Crusader states really being a, a predominantly Frankish, um, a Sicilian and European culture. Um, so what I've done is moved the Crusader troops to be the tavern mercenaries, which I feel like is a much better historical fit. This means that anyone um, traveling around the world can hire these troops um, and, you know, build up their own Crusader army, sail off to the, to the Levant if they want to. Um, these troops are some of the strongest in game. So if we compare these to the to the Italian troops we just saw, um, much more heavily armoured. Um, so we've got our spearmen, a crusader sergeant, which is essentially a uh, a, a foot knight, um, as well as then our hospi uh, hospitaller knight, um, one of the strongest uh, cavalry units in game, heavily armoured, um, and also you know recruitable within the tavern, so anyone can get them quite easily. Um, some of the other mercenary troops, uh, and these are the faction mercenaries, so, uh, there is some quite unique units in here, for example the Order of Assassins, um, but these are much harder to get a hold of because you basically have to capture them um, as mercenaries. Um, but if you do, um, again, some of the strongest units in game. So moving on to kingdoms or factions. So we have um, pretty much all the major independent kingdoms from the period, um, as well as you know their, their ruler at the time, and then each of the major clans, um, their associated lords, um, and their banners. Um, you'll notice the banners do look a bit different to what you might see in other mods. Um, that's just a case of the time period. Um, the banners were very simple uh, in 1100, um, with heraldry not being uh, very widespread yet. Just in terms of numbers, um, you can see these on the mod pages, but we have 26 kingdoms, 185 clans with accurate banners, uh, and 464 lords based on real-life individuals. 
Um, this is my uh, my source material. I spend very uh, a lot of hours, uh, weeks, and months um, putting this stuff together. Um, but down to the level of you know individuals, spouses, family members, what age they were in the year 1100, um, so on and so forth. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of data and research has gone into this. Um, I have recreated the leaders and lords um, as best I could. Um, but I have not always included all of the children, in some cases just one or two for balance reasons. Um, one of the big exceptions though is with the Rus, um, in particular the Rurik clan, um, because it is so large um, and so many, um, so many children from that family um, actually lead their own clans. Um, actually works out quite well for them because um, they are actually their own independent clan leaders. Um, but can still be related um, to the other members of their family. Uh, for a lot of um, a lot of the female spouses, the actual names are unknown. So in those cases, I've had to actually just make up something um, as best I could. Um, but where I've had to do that, I've used a historically accurate um, name um, based on you know research that we've done. So every Lord has a unique face, uh, skills and trait attributes. These are generated at random. So you may actually find some, um, you know, some, some that are a bit out of balance. Um, feel free to call those out on Discord um, and we can do a balance pass on those. Another feature of Vanilla um, that we're using is the ability to have um, a unit of a different culture um, within a kingdom, either as a spouse or a, or a family member. Um, so for example, if we take a look at the Kingdom of Hungary um, within the Arpad uh, clan, um, we can see we have Felicia of Sicily, um, who was a Sicilian, um, but actually married um, to Coloman. Um, she's actually the daughter of Roger the First, who is our ruler of the county of Sicily. So all those relationships, um, we've tried to keep those intact as best we can. Um, there are some errors. Some units have the incorrect culture based on who they actually are, um, but we are getting those as we find them. So just a few more things to note um, on cultures. Um, like we said before, um, the French kingdoms uh, and German kingdoms are the largest. They tend to go to war with each other, um, but they also will swallow up their smaller neighbours. Uh, For example, England often invades France. Um, sorry, France often invades England. England often invades uh, Scotland and Ireland, um, and so forth. Um, depending on how you like to play, you may wish to actually join one of the small kingdoms um, and help fend off the, the big guys. Um, in those cases, the smallest ones are actually Venice, um, only have one settlement. Um, Papal States, which have only got two. Our new Baltic States, um, which has got three settlements. Um, and then the smallest of all is actually uh, Portuguese culture. Um, it, is, uh, it is a playable culture, um, but it does not have a kingdom. Um, does have one settlement though, um, which is uh, here, the uh, the castle of Ribadavia. Um, so they currently sit under the Kingdom of Castile, um, but you could still um, play as Portuguese, take that settlement and establish that kingdom uh, if that's how you wanted to play. So that's it for this edition of Europe 1100. Um, hope you're enjoying the latest update and uh, I'll be back soon with my next video which will be covering gameplay tips um, and I guess uh, some of the more unique characteristics of the mod you may wish to include in your next playthrough. See you next time.